JavaScript for most of its life has been an absolute disaster of a language. This might sound crazy to someone who's not a web developer or has no experience with this. Nowadays, it's better. It's actually a lot better than it used to be. In the early days, every web browser and sometimes even different versions of web browsers were basically their own separate operating system that used this same language, but all had their own different system libraries that operated in slightly different ways. Nowadays, we have tooling that automates all of this stuff, and it's generally good enough to just write things once, and it mostly works. I'm not going to say always, but mostly works. Internet Explorer in the early days was one of the most prevalent examples of being a nightmare to work for. This is why a lot of government websites only ran on Internet Explorer. They literally couldn't run on anything else. But that does not mean that Chromium, Firefox, Safari, all of the mobile browsers didn't have their own set of ridiculous design decisions. And along with this, there was just random things missing from the standard libraries. This is the reason why the infamous left pad existed, which was a function to pad a string with things on the left hand side. There was no built in function to do this at the time. And today, we're looking at another one of these ridiculous examples, a function that should have been in JavaScript from the start is array, which does exactly what it says on the tin. It checks if a variable is an array. Now, any of the modern browser devs might be saying, oh, but what about array.isArray? And yes, in modern web browser environments, this is a thing that exists that you should be using. But it didn't exist at the time. There was no built-in function that actually did this. And then when it did exist, it didn't magically exist everywhere. It took time for different browsers to actually go and get it working. But then people were still running out of date browsers, so you still needed some way that would consistently work everywhere. And that's exactly what this did. But here's the kicker. Years after browsers are supporting this, years after Node.js version is supporting this, in 2020, 40 million downloads a week. Not a year, not a month, a week, okay? Presumably it's gone down though because everything supports it now. No, this week it's lower, but many of the weeks throughout this year, it's been 70 million plus. This week it's lower because it's Christmas week. It might be hard to see on the video, but it's trending upwards. It's still getting more and more downloads. It might hit 100 million next year. I don't know. This is completely useless for modern web browsers, but there are still cases where it's clearly being used. But do you want to know the best part about this entire situation? Checking if a variable is an array is not difficult in JavaScript. This isn't some massive package, some massive function. Do you want to know what the entire function is? This. This is the entire function. This can be flattened down into a single line. The rest of this stuff is just extra stuff for the package. This is all that matters. So the way it works is like this. This toString.call is basically going to convert whatever thing you put into it into this object string. So with nothing in there, it's going to say object undefined. With a number, it's going to say object one. With say a object, it's going to say object object. And with an array, it's going to say object array. And then basically, if the thing output by this equals object array, then it's an object array. We're good there. So if this function outputs this string, it's an array. That's all there is to it. I know what you're thinking. This package is ridiculous. Why does it exist? If it is just a single line, why don't I just grab the single line? And yes, you're making a very good point. However, it is not 
as ridiculous as it initially seems. It's still kind of ridiculous, but not as. This actually led to two really interesting discussions. One of those being license discussion, and the other one being why. We'll start with license discussion, because this one seems slightly more tame. Now, this project actually has a software license attached to it. That license being, which makes sense for the most part, an MIT license. But can you really license something that is just a single line of code? This discussion is actually a continuation of another discussion started over on Node.js. Inline is Array. Basically, the idea is previously, they were actually bundling this module as like a thing with Node.js, but they decided it's so simple, why don't we just inline it instead? And it started off pretty reasonably. Inlining is a perfectly acceptable solution and entails negligible maintenance cost, and then very quickly started to derail. I dig the spirit, but it's copying the package verbatim. Why don't you just stick with the package until you can bump it and remove it, and then CC'd the original developer? But the dev didn't respond instantly, and other people started talking about the license. This change violates Isarray's MIT license. The above copyright notice and this permission notice shall be included in all copies or substantial portions of the software. And the developer of this merge request didn't want any drama, so they're like, yeah, I should probably pull in a copy of Isarray's license unless Julian Ruber chimes in that simply referencing the license instead of including it, but including the license notice is fine as well. But let's just pretend for a second that we live in a world where a very simple string comparison one-liner is an original idea. Even so, the idea itself isn't actually original. How does the license even make sense here? I mean, it's nice that someone put it into a convenient NPM package, and I realize that NPM packages require licenses, but licensing this line is akin to licensing this line. It should just be removed when including it here. I'm with Kangax here. All the packages is a single line function. It's the same function I've written many times in the past, but I would never consider it owned by somebody else purely because somebody else has written the same thing and just so happened to slap an MIT license on it. This is the best part. This Kangax guy here actually has a reference to using this line four years before the package existed. So does that make him the original owner? Well, no, not really. He says something different. No offense to Julian, who I'm sure put in the work, but it's simply wrong to attach an MIT license that carries restrictions to a one-line pattern that was discovered way back and has been used extensively ever since. Both Mark Miller and I wrote about it as far back as in 2009 without claiming any kind of copyright it's just a language that we all use and learn, discover, and share. And then finally, the package developer Julian responded to the comments. This is not a matter of interpretation or judging whether you think that licensing seems fit for the amount of code. This library is licensed as MIT and thus needs to have the license attached wherever it's used. You're free not to use it, to hate it, rewrite it, whatever, but that's how it is. So what about those things that existed four years before your package existed? Do you now need to retroactively go and license them with your license even though those existed first? That's not how that works. That's not how that works even remotely. I'm for using bundle dependencies too for that matter, if this really is a problem that needs to be solved. I would also gladly accept one Mio, I guess one million USD to lift the licensing restrictions attached to said piece of software up to you. Edit, also keep in mind that a one-line module always is more than one line of code. It's documentation, tests, and history in the repo summoning this random person here but they're not going to inline your documentation, your testing, history, or anything else. They're going to inline the thing that already existed. And in the continuation thread, someone also pointed out there was already a JavaScript framework using this exact line four years prior. So the copyright claim goes even further out the window. And for the record, the dev also said the one Mio thing wasn't actually serious. But the funnier discussion I want to talk about is just called why. 
Sorry, but that doesn't make any sense because it's one line of code. Why did you make it as an NPM module? And most people were agreeing here, like, why does this need to exist? And the initial comment explains it very well, because older environments didn't have an array dot is array, and being one line of code doesn't mean it's easy to get right. Many people screw up one liners, and that is actually very true. Many people may make a mistake here, and it works slightly differently, like triple equals and double equals in JavaScript mean very different things. And if you mistake them, it might not work in every single situation. If you don't want to use it, then don't. Many people, however, do. 70 million people. And it's much better for the ecosystem that that's the case. And this one user took this package personally. If you can't trust a developer to write one single line of code, then honestly, GTFO. The index.js file is four lines long, and you're expecting to me think that you wrote four functioning lines of code while you believe I can't even write one line of code correctly. Well, you made a mistake in this sentence, and even after editing this, you still left it there, so yes, you actually may make a mistake at some point. And in response to, are you confused why such a tiny module can get so important for the ecosystem? He says, no, almost nothing can surprise me anymore. I've seen shit that goes well beyond my perceived highest possible value of stupidity, and I'm trying to keep my expectations as low as possible, but it's not effing possible. There's always someone that manages to be dumber than the previous one, and I can't take it anymore. This led to several existential crises, depression, and self-hatred as I, for my part, am doing a great job at effing up everything everyone else seems to deal with fine. For F's sake, just don't write meaningless, useless, unnecessary, counterproductive, bandwidth, and time-wasting garbage hopefully no enterprise will ever have to rely on. I might as well spend the rest of my day going through the dependence list and create a PR to delete this utter trash. Which is, you know... A response, I guess. <laughs> Maybe, you know, go outside, touch some grass. It's probably a good first step. And that's just one of the angry comments. Probably the worst, but it's not the only one. There are people that are really, really angry that this package, this module actually exists. It exists because there was a time where it made sense to exist. Nowadays, it doesn't make sense to exist, so you don't need to use it. Makes sense. Don't use it. You're not paying for NPM servers. Why does it matter to you that this package exists? If you don't like it, not using it is pretty simple. It's very easy to inline. It's a single line of code, and you're good to go. Web development has always been, and likely will be at least until Chromium takes over everything, an absolute mess to deal with. And, you know, that's kind of what makes it fun and the reason why there's so much money involved in this space. But let me know your thoughts in the comment section down below. Did you know about IsArray? Do you think this package makes sense to exist? Did you learn something about the history of JavaScript? I would love to know. So if you like this video, I'm going to go and like the video. And if you really like the video and you want to become one of these amazing people over here, go check out my Patreon, subscribe, suddenly barrow pay linked in the description down below. I've got a podcast called Tech Over T. I've got a gaming channel called Brady on Games. That's going to be it for me. And I'm out.